relational gifts that were given to uh, you and others when you first accepted Jesus. And those seven gifts are called grace gifts. There's nothing we, we did. It's by the grace of God that we have been given these gifts. And there are seven of them. Uh, we looked at prophecy, service, teaching, exhortation, giving, leadership, and mercy. And what we're doing is considering which one of those is our primary motivational gift that God, through the Holy Spirit, gave us when we accepted Jesus Christ. Then we looked at the purpose for these gifts. And we saw that the purpose for these gifts is for the common good of the church. And we noticed that, the, that what they do is they edify us. They build us up as a church. And they extend the kingdom of God beyond this church. And we were looking at 1 Corinthians 12 last week. And we had divided... Um, these into three groups of gifts. But we notice that they're all supernatural. None of these gifts come when you were born into this world. For instance, uh, you may have a talent in art. You may have a talent in music. You may have a talent in sports that was a natural uh, talent that you had. Um, when I was in second grade, somebody said, wow, you can draw. <laughs> and you're only seven years old. And so, you know, I pursued that in my school. And, and my, my undergraduate degree is in art. But I learned that. I was born with that basic ability. But I learned a lot of that in school. Well, that isn't how the spiritual gifts work, as you know. They are given to us as the Holy Spirit decides what each one of us needs in order to contribute collectively to building up the church. The Holy Spirit, we, we looked at last week, always points to Jesus. If somebody says, I have a spiritual gift, and they tell you what it is, but they are always talking about themselves, and they are asking you to lift them up because of the gift they have, then we can question whether that really is a spiritual gift. Now in the church at Corinth, they were proud of some of their spiritual gifts. And, and to the point where they said, mine is more important than yours. And we learned last week from 1 Corinthians 12 that each of our gifts is as important as any. And we all, all of our gifts work together for the common good. I asked you two questions last week. I... I pray you've been thinking about this and seeking God about it. What is your primary motivational <laughs> spiritual gift? Which one of the seven? We talked about how you might identify it. What gives you the most joy? What makes you feel the most fulfilled? What produces the most fruit of the Spirit in you of these seven? That's one way for you to identify what your primary motivational gift is. Because you will never be as happy and as joyful as when you are serving in that way. Exercising that gift. You will never feel as fulfilled with any of the others, you will be somewhat fulfilled, but never as fulfilled as with your primary. And then finally, church leadership will recognize that gift in you. 
members of the church will recognize that gift in you. Last week we went through the supernatural revelation group of gifts. I have them grayed out because we're not going to cover those again this week in detail. But we did look at the word of wisdom and in particular we looked at a scripture that showed how wisdom came from God. And it wasn't something that was learned at school. We also learned about word of knowledge, how it came from God through the Holy Spirit for a specific time, for a specific purpose. And we looked at an example in Acts 5 of that. And it's supernatural. This knowledge did not come by getting uh, passing school, getting a grade, studying a certain subject. It, it, it doesn't come that way. It comes from the Holy Spirit. And it's supernatural. And then we looked at discerning of spirits, which is distinguishing good and evil spirits. And we looked at Acts 8 in particular, where there was an example where one of the apostles knew, knew, that a spirit was not from God and, and spoke that to that person. We talked about how we need in the Believer's Bible Fellowship Church, we need words of wisdom. We need words of knowledge. And we need to be able to, to discern spirits. And that's where that's kind of where we ended last week. So this week we're going to um, go through the other two groups, and we'll look at those in the Word. The first one is faith. Would somebody uh, mind reading uh, Mark eleven twenty two and twenty three? When you find it, just go ahead and. And read Mark 11, 22 through 23. Have faith in God. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and, and does not doubt in his heart, believe that what he says will happen, will be done for him. Super natural faith. Jesus said, if you have this faith from God, you can say to a mountain, be removed, and it will go. Do you know of anybody who had this supernatural faith in your experiences and moved a mountain? Do you know of anybody? I do. When we lived in Kentucky, I may have told this story before, so forgive me if I did, but it's such a good story. When we lived in Kentucky, there were a lot of hollows, you know, tall hills, way down in the hollows, and the roads went all around those mountains. And we knew a person in the church we were attending, and she had small children who had to catch the bus. And they always would go out to the end of her driveway and they had to stand on the road, to the side of the road, to catch the bus. The road curved around a steep mountain. And if you were in a car and you were coming around that mountain, you would never see them standing there until you got right up on them because it was such a curve around that mountain. More than once, there were accidents there and, and this the church member feared for the lives of her children. She read what we just read. She began to pray, God, move this mountain. I believe that this mountain will be moved. 
And do you know that within a month, the Kentucky Department of Highways came out there with steam shovels and road graders and they literally cut through the edge of that mountain and took it away because of the danger on that curve. It happened. And from that point on, if you came there and you started around that curve, you could, you could see her children up there waiting for the bus. And she believed without a doubt that her prayer is what caused that to happen. Because they didn't take any other mountain out of the way. <laughs> they took that one. This is supernatural faith that God through the Holy Spirit gives us. Now there will be times in this church, I have absolutely no doubt, there will be times in this church when we will need supernatural faith. We will be dealing with something, and I don't know what it's going to be, but I have no doubt that it is going to be. And we will need somebody here or more than one here, with the gift of faith, supernatural faith, who can speak that faith, and we will be edified by that, and we will join with in that supernatural faith for, for some something that's going to come about in this church. The reason I know it's going to happen is because Every church needs this supernatural faith. Every church experiences something that when it first comes about, you go, oh my goodness, there's no way we're going to get through this. And then somebody steps out and they go, I believe. That's how it uses us. I believe that God. And then they start speaking to us. You do. Somebody here will do this speaking to us by supernatural faith and we will join with that faith. <clears throat> it will happen. I just don't know what it is or when it is. Gifts of healing. This is curing sickness and disease. Mark 16, 15 through 18. You know there are people that believe when the apostles died. This stopped. Mark 16. They believe that the apostles would lay hands on somebody, like Dorothy, and Dorothy would be empowered then with the ability to heal and do miracles. But they believe that once the apostles died, there was no other way for Christians to get this supernatural ability to bring about healing, to let God work through them. Well, let's look in Mark 16, starting with verse 15. This is Jesus speaking. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes in that and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now, listen to what he says. These signs will follow the apostles. Is that what it says? What does it say? These signs will follow those who, those who believe. You know who that is? That's you and me. That's other churches. That's other believers. These signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. When we were at the Brian Church and the opportunity presented itself, there were countless people praying for Walt Harrington and his bladder cancer. 
But I remember the day that he had faith enough to allow us to lay hands on him. And he told us, and some of you were there, you, you remember this. He said, oh my goodness, I have never felt this before. I just felt a warmth from the top of my head go down through my entire body to my feet. Do you remember him? Anybody remember him saying that? Yes. Mm -hmm. He was sincere, too. Absolutely. He wasn't just trying to conjure it up. And you know that when he went for his annual biopsy and they took three of them from his bladder, you know the story. Yeah. Within a week, they reported back and they told him, there is no more cancer in your bladder. And he had been treated for at least four years for that. Now, why God chose to do that with Walt and he would choose not to do that with someone else is, is God. And, and we can't tell God what to do. But sometimes he does that. Nell's call after we had begun meeting as a church and he said, my son has colon cancer and they're operating on him and we prayed that the Lord would heal them and they operated on him and he was told not to go back to work right away. and he did. And while he was at work, he lifted something big. I don't recall what it is, but he fell over backwards. And where they had done the surgery, it twisted it out of shape. And his intestine bound up. Otherwise, then he'll turn it over on him. Yeah. And, and, and for, <clears throat> what, a week or more? Twelve days. Twelve days, nothing moved through his intestines. To a point where it was getting really, really dangerous. Stomach was just in everything. Nails called, and he said, this is really, really bad. And we stopped right then, and we prayed. On the phone. On the phone. And was it the next morning they were supposed to operate? Yeah, they were going to operate on the very next morning. And they didn't want to because he really hadn't healed from the first surgery. And you got a call, right? Yeah, less than three hours. A little over two hours after we prayed. His intestines turned over, got back in place, and everything came through. Daughter-in-law called and says, Dad, a dam broke. Yeah. I didn't know what she was talking about. <laughs> For a minute, I had to think on that one. But, you know, it's how quick it happened. God is, God is sovereign, and He He does <clears throat> what He chooses for His reasons. You know, <clears throat> I remember when Tina and I were first beginning to walk in in ministry. And a couple <clears throat> called us and said, our teenage boy is in the hospital. He's in a coma. He's been in a coma for a long time. He had a car accident. They say he's not going to come out of it. Would you please go and pray for him? And so Tina and I went up to the hospital room. There was nobody there, no nurses. Nobody was in there. We walked in. I remember Tina took him by the feet, and I put my hands on his head. And I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of this coma. And his eyelids started fluttering. Tears started rolling down his cheeks. And his eyes popped up. And he sat up. Immediately when that happened, a nurse came in just checking on him. And she said, what in the world are you guys doing to him? <laughs> Get out of here! And she literally ran us out of the room. 
and the little lights out in the hallway for emergency started blinking like crazy and people were running and we went down and sat in the waiting room. And he came out of the coma. And we checked back about a week later. <clears throat> and he was dead. We thought, what? How could this be? And we learned from his family that when he came out of the coma, they assigned a nurse to him full time who was a Christian. He was not a believer. She led him to the Lord. And then he died. He said, we got another call shortly after that to go and pray for a lady who had cancer. We went, we prayed, and she died. Ask the Lord, why? You know, but but God is sovereign, and He knows what's best. And sometimes He takes people for His reasons and His purposes. But today. We won't hesitate to go pray. None of us should hesitate to pray with anybody for me. Especially if God seems to have touched you supernaturally to pray for healing. But we have to understand it is not us. It is God through His Holy Spirit supernaturally and God is sovereign. And, and so we, we grieve and, and we ask why sometimes. But this is a gift that God has given to the church. If you turn to James 5, let's turn over. And we've, we've talked about this before. James 5. Verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Call for the elders. You can call one else or me and some of you have done this any time of the night we don't care if we can't get there we will pray over the phone but we understand that God is suffering but we've also seen God work miracles can I share something uh, just an example of this. One month back, first start hurting me. I went to the doctor. This is quick, and he told me I was going to have to have a six by a sixteen hour back surgery. And I, every Sunday, every Wednesday night, I was in front of the elder to see God what they did want to see me come in. But I did not have to have surgery. God was good. It's this is a difficult thing. Because we always would like things the way that we would be blessed with. And God brings blessings in other ways sometimes, and we just don't understand why. But He did give this to the church, and He did give it to us for the purpose of curing sickness and disease in the church. Working of miracles. This is when something changes in nature. In other words, the way God created things, you know, they work a certain way. Well, do you remember
remember when Jesus was in the boat with the uh, apostles and this storm came up and he was sleeping as I recall and they woke him up and they said, well, what's going on? We're going to die. You remember that? What did he say to the storm? Yeah. Yeah, but what did he say? To, that's right. What did he say to the storm? Though? Peace. Peace. Be still. Be still. You see, that was the working of a miracle. That went against nature. Who is it that can speak to a storm and tell it to be quiet and it calms down? Who does that? And you say, well, Jesus does. Well, I gonna... tried it once. It didn't work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We don't all have this supernatural gift. That's one of the problems that the church has had with the teachings about these gifts. Somehow, it has been concluded that everybody, Mike, you got every single one of these. Don, you've got every single one. Marlene, you got all of it. You can do any of these. We learn from the scripture that the Holy Spirit does not do that because He wants us to rely on each other. Let's look at supernatural vocal. There, there are three in this category. <clears throat> the first one is prophecy. And in, and in the sense of, of this uh, supernatural spiritual gift, it's talking about somebody speaking a word from God or explaining the word of God with and the word coming directly from God, the explanation or or the word from God. Sometimes it, it is in the future. Sometimes it's it's God speaking through us about something in the future. Okay. But sometimes it's a word from God about now. It's supernatural. This isn't something where you do a little chart and you say, what are the positives and what are you? Right, done this. We, we used to do it. First house we bought. Me and we have a long line of things in each column. Here's all the pluses and here's all the minuses. You know? when we, were, we did the best we could making the decision. You know? But that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about a supernatural revelation of a word from God that is spoken to this church by somebody. <clears throat> now, we got some we got a few things working against us. And other churches do too. <clears throat> what if you have a word from God right now? Typically there's a senior pastor, other pastors, and whoever it is, like this morning, is up here speaking to us as a church. <coughs> this can only happen in this morning if I am willing to step aside for a minute and somebody has a word from God. Typically, churches are so organized that the freedom in the, in the Holy Spirit, especially in this area, is totally quenched. I know a church not far from here. And they practice. They practice, practice, practice. Their worship services and their singing and what's going to happen. And they have a schedule. And I am not kidding you. It's by the second by the second. And if the Holy Spirit ever moved on anybody, they would have no opportunity. Now, <clears throat> Paul had to write Corinth because things were out of hand there. They all thought that they could exercise their spiritual gift all at once, and it was total chaos. Not only that, but there were people who thought, 
I am really somebody because of the gift that I have. So you need to just sit down and be quiet and listen to me. And it, it, you know, and they were in a mess. Paul had to straighten them out. He even went to the point about different kinds of tongues. He said, you know what? Even if you do this, you only do it by two or three. And you don't do that unless there's somebody there that interprets. So, I know churches who won't... They, they would not want me to preach this. Because you have to deal with these things. You know... The Holy Spirit. We learned last week that He moves as the wind where He wills. And the only way you know that He's moving is because you see the effects of it. You know? It is sometimes an anxious thing to allow the Holy Spirit to move. We should not be afraid of these gifts. And yet, we should also have order. God is a God of order. Chaos is would not be there. The Holy Spirit does not bring about chaos. Now, I want to wrap up. So, so these are the three groups of ministry gifts in 1 Corinthians. And those ministry gifts will flow usually from your motivational gift. So if you are someone who, who prophesies, God gives you a word and you speak it to us as a church, that's probably going to be flowing from one of these up here. And it's, it's you know, it, it, it'll flow from that motivational gift. And here's the other thing. If you step outside of it, and you try to operate outside of the gift that God's given you, they're, they're, you're going to struggle. You know, look at the one He's given you, or ones. Focus on those. If you want to, you can pray with Glenn and, and Nels and me. You can talk with us. You can say, you know, I'm, I'm just... When I have joy, when I'm fulfilled, when the fruits of the Spirit are there... It's when I'm doing this. And, and we, as a church, should recognize that in each and every one of us and do whatever we can to encourage you to exercise and operate in, in whatever gift or gifts you've been given. We want to encourage that. We want to have opportunities for that. But let's look at Jesus as our example. Would, would someone read Matthew 3, 13 and read on through chapter 4, verse 1? Those go right along with each other. The chapter 4, verse 1 follows Matthew 3, 13. Whoever finds that, go ahead and read it. His 
human form received the baptism or the infill of the Holy Spirit. Now, he was God. He was the Son of God. And yet, he said that all righteousness should be fulfilled. I need to be baptized. And God acknowledged his faithfulness and said, Hear him. Someone read Matthew 12, 28. saying, if I drive out demons, how? By the Spirit of God. The kingdom has come upon you. What about Luke 4.18? What did Jesus say there? Who has that scripture? First Peter 4, 7 through 10 was our scripture reading this morning. So we've looked at that scripture, if you don't mind. We'll, we'll, we'll look at these points underneath this uh, part of our message. First of all, the Spirit of God descended upon Jesus, and He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. The Son of God, here, born of a virgin, who would go through being crucified on a cross and resurrected from the dead had the Spirit of God come on him. He cast out demons by the Spirit of God. He preached, healed, liberated, and restored sight by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, pay careful attention to this next statement. Jesus performs supernatural acts through the power of the Holy Spirit. He said He did. We're told He did. He is our example. We have that same, we have the same Holy Spirit living in us who gave Jesus in the flesh supernatural ability to do the miracles, the casting out, the raising from the dead. And if you say, well, He did those because He was the Son of God. Well, yes, He was the Son of God. But the point that we're making here that God's asking us to consider is He did it through the power of the Holy Spirit that was given him by God as he began his ministry. And you say, no, it, it, it happened because he was the Son of God. Well, do you know anybody else that raised people from the dead in the New Testament? Sure, there are examples. Do you know anybody else that cast out demons? Absolutely. All his disciples came back to him two by two and they said, what? We're able to cast out demons. But that was after he breathed the Holy Spirit on them. Now, in Mark 16, we just read that we as believers, we, God can give us these gifts. So I've written down a prayer this week, and again, I'm going to pray it just like it's, it's written down here. And you, you pray this, you look at this, 
also. And, and, and think about this as we lift it up before God. Father God, show us our primary motivational spiritual gift or gifts. Show us our ministry gifts, God. Use us and our gifts to build up Believer's Bible Fellowship Church and to extend your kingdom, God. Help us not to quench or grieve the Holy Spirit. Help us to minister our gifts to each other in love. Thank you for doing that. This may be the first time for some of you that you've actually considered the gifts. We, you may have been taught about the gifts, but this may be the first time as a member of the church that you're considering what gifts the Holy Spirit has given you. I can tell you the three of us, we met and we prayed and we looked at the extent to which it appeared that we were operating in spiritual gifts. Remember when we were at your house? Remember the three of us? We asked God to give us direction and show us how to encourage all of you to recognize your spiritual gift. And, and the Lord gave us this series of messages to help us. If you want to talk about this, if you want to pray about this, we're available. This is important for this church. Otherwise, we will walk in our own abilities and we will try to do what we think this church should be doing in our own power. That's what happens in churches that do not exercise and, and believe in these spiritual gifts. And you know, sometimes they turn out great. I know churches that have thousands of people in them. But they run it like a corporation. All the decisions are made as if they were business people. And it's all made from their flesh thinking and logic. And you know, sometimes you get to growth. But it's numbers. We're interested in growth spiritually. We're interested in people accepting Jesus. We're not hung up on numbers here. Anyway, um, this is the message that God has given us as a church. And I pray that we will all pray about this, think about this, and identify what our gifts are. And I can guarantee you that the leadership of this church will encourage you and, and want you to have opportunities to exercise your spiritual You know, it might not be this week, but there are things that God will take this church into that will give you opportunities. Otherwise, He wouldn't have put you here with your spiritual gifts. You're here for a reason. And your gifts are for a reason. And it may be a week, two weeks, a month, two months. I don't know. But I can guarantee you that you will have opportunities to exercise those spiritual gifts. And you will be full of joy. You will feel so fulfilled. And we will have fruit of the Spirit hanging everywhere. In this church and in our lives. I believe that. Is there anyone here that needs to respond to an altar call in any way? You want prayers, uh, you want anointing, you want anything. And it's okay if we don't have any this week. But if we do, we, we want to help pray and meet those needs. Okay. As you reflect on our message last week and this week, 
And if you have questions or you want to run something by us, call us. We'll, we want to spend time with you praying and thinking about this. Because we want this church to be to the glory of God. And we don't want to run this church. And I use the word run. I'll put it in quotes. Through our own logic and thinking. 